So a warm welcome to the press preview. First look at what's on your Sunday morning front pages as they arrive to us. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with writer Christina Patterson and the Times columnist Matthew Syed. Good evening to both of you. Before we have a look at those front pages, let's see what some of them say. The Telegraph reports tensions in the Cabinet with aides to Theresa May apparently telling Boris Johnson and Michael Gove that a key part of this week's EU divorce agreement was essentially meaningless. The Observer suggests that some EU officials are not happy with the prospect of the UK being given special status in any post-Brexit trade agreements they fear it would put their own countries at a disadvantage. But The Express is suggesting pretty much the exact opposite, saying we've got the EU over a barrel. The Mail, meanwhile, reporting on cabinet tensions of a very different kind, claiming that the Prime Minister had to intervene in an alleged verbal altercation between the Chancellor and the Defence Secretary over defence cuts. So let's talk about some of that with Christina and Matthew <coughs> now. Um, starting with the Observer, why don't we look at that? EU officials don't like how Brexit deal Britain might get an advantage. Christina, this is the one side of several front pages tomorrow that apparently we're not going to get any sort of good trade deal at the end of this. Well, I don't think they're exactly saying we're not going to get, going to get a good trade deal. I think what they're saying is what's so special about you. And um, I think that, I mean, I feel a bit sorry for Theresa May because she's had, you know, kind of the most knackering week of her entire life and two hours sleep and then, you know, a brief moment of praise from the country, even from the odd Brexiteer, because she's just had her entire party gunning for her back. She achieves this thing, which is basically, it's a holding position, but it's better than the alternative, which is kind of disaster, crashing out, etc. And now um, EU officials are saying, well, actually, um, you know, great, but don't get your hopes up for the bespoke deal that um, all the Brexiteers are claiming is possible. And I don't see anything new in this because it always seemed very obvious to me and to many of us that it was never going to be possible to give the UK a special deal because obviously if we got a special deal, everybody else would want a special deal. And but so what, what we have seen with this though, Matthew, this last few weeks is that the EU don't want things to end badly because when Theresa May was in those negotiations and things looked like they were going to happen but then the DUP called, apparently Jean-Claude Juncker was very, very keen to placate the situation and make sure that this next step was reached. So all these noises coming from the EU, is it just them digging their heels in again and yeah. everything will be okay further down the road? Yeah, and, and I think that's right. And I, picking up what Christina said, I'm kind of quite admiring of Theresa May. When you think of the day Barclay of the general election, the humiliation of that conference speech where she got that terrible cough, everyone said she was toast. We thought she was toast. Almost every mm. pundit thought she couldn't possibly survive as prime minister. And she has pulled off a really impressive... Um, first stage but that's really the point is that at the end of that first stage the really hard yards start now what will Brexit look like and that's where the irreconcilables mm. in the cabinet come to the fore because on the one hand you've got the Brexiteers who, who, who don't want to be in the customs union don't want to be in the single market and then you've got others in the cabinet and they're gonna have a cabinet meeting about this mm. and then they've got the additional problem that you asked about which is whether the European Union are prepared to give them what they eventually come to decide that they want. I'm not sure they'll ever come to decide within the cabinet a unified position. No, I just can't, can't see how they they're going to reconcile they those can't. two strands. And Christina, that's on the front page of The Telegraph, this yeah. rift about this upcoming meeting. And I suppose it is still quite astonishing to some people that they haven't had this meeting already about <laughs> yeah. what it, the end of the situation is. It is absolutely breathtaking. But I'm, I'm afraid, and this is where we really have what, you know, whether you were Remain or Brexit, and nobody obviously can guess which of those camps in because I obviously may always maintain such a studiously neutral front on this, don't I, Matthew? <laughs> However, the fact that nobody that David Davies, Theresa May, Liam Fox, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, all these swashbuckling 
people have known, not that Theresa May is swashbuckling, but some of the others claim to be or aspire to be, that none of them has said, we want X deal, we want Canada, we want Customs Union. We, they just haven't said what they want. And I think the EU, I mean, we have been a laughing stock over this because I think the EU trying to do some sort of serious negotiation here. Frankly, we should have had, I mean, I'm no fan of Arlene Foster, but she's clearly a million times better as a negotiator because she knows what she wants and she goes for it whereas we're kind of saying well we don't want this we don't want that we don't know what we do want and um and they have had to kind of guess all the way along and now they're finally it's like it's like a poker game it's okay we want you to put your cards on the table and lay out what you want and no doubt everybody in the cabinet wants something completely different and what in do you fact think the, the well, I th I th meeting will be? It, it's the fundamental differences that if there isn't going to be a hard border between the north and the south then it sort of means that the Northern Ireland has to be within the EU Customs yes. Union. But if there isn't going to be a hard border in the Irish Sea, then Northern Ireland has to be in the UK Customs Union. The implication of that is the UK has to be yeah, in the EU Customs, Customs exactly. Union, which I don't think Gove or yeah, Johnson will exactly. accept. What, what Gove has said today is that it doesn't matter. Even if we have a soft Brexit at some point in the next general election, we could change our minds. One of the really deep problems for business throughout this whole affair has been uncertainty. How can we make our long-term investment decisions when we don't know the future status of our trading relationship with the European Union? If all of that is up for grabs at every subsequent general election, then it makes it incredibly difficult in the long term to resolve the uncertainty. Um, so I feel in a funny kind of a way that that 24 hours of breathing space that Theresa May mm. got for really steadying the starting pistol on the negotiations themselves are now bringing us to the fundamental irreconcilables between yeah. the Brexiteers and the Remainers in the Cabinet who reflect this deeply polarised nation. Mm. So I, it's like a ray of sunshine, but, I, I think this is going to be incredibly difficult. I don't think we've got anywhere near that. You know, you're both, <laughs> you're both being stuff. quite downbeat about this. <laughs> which yes. is Come on, let's complete talk. contradiction to the Sunday Express front page exclusive We've got the EU over a barrel, and they're saying <laughs> Theresa May should demand a gold-plated trade deal because well, we sure. have the upper hand. <laughs> yeah. well, they they, they need us more than they need well, the, us more um, than we need them. The but. Sunday Express can carry on in their delightful cloud cuckoo land, but you know Theresa May can demand whatever she likes. But you know she could demand golden unicorns, but it doesn't mean that the EU are going to give them. I think there aren't very many golden unicorns on offer, or gold-plated offer, or whatever it else it is they want to, they want to offer. Yeah. So so it, it's not looking particularly good. To go back to the point about. The, the Ireland thing. I really don't understand what did Arlene Foster think was possible because you cannot have a hard border and not be in the customs union. So, and if, how can you go for hard Brexit and no hard border? The two simply aren't compatible. But they've been talking, haven't they, about certain types of customs arrangements where you have different regulations. Well, they want the kind of abracadabra, well, they want the kind of abracadabra magic telepathic one, but you know what? That doesn't exist. But so. when you get down, I think it's right, when you get down to the detail of what that would actually look like and you see beyond the linguistic fudge, it's it becomes possible. a lot more it's, it's, like, it's like this. It's like this balance between. What are the two terms that have been used? It was divergence and alignment. Alignment, alignment and yeah. Divergence. Oh, gosh, yeah. I don't know. Regulatory and continued, alignment. Continued yeah. Which alignment. somebody else has said um, today is completely meaningless in EU law. So all this, we've spent all week learning about regulatory alignment and it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of sort of made up magic concept that means nothing to the EU. So yeah. I don't know. Let's hold off on Brexit for a few <laughs> minutes. Turn our attention to the front page of the Daily Mail. Now, they claim that the Prime Minister at some point had to separate two ministers <laughs> in a bus stop in the Commons and if we look at the inside pages of the mail we can see who is involved. Uh, Matthew, tell us more about this yeah, spat between the Defence Secretary and the Chancellor. Any, any cynic out there hoping that there was fisticuffs is going to be disappointed. It wasn't actually a, a, a punching. Sounds thing. like it though, doesn't it? Well, appa apparently according to the story, Hammond and Williamson have been arguing a lot over the last few days about all sorts of different things, and they've been slurring each other. There was a Dad's Army reference, wasn't there, of Hammond to, what did he say about Williamson? Uh, Pike. 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 Pike, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that they started arguing about this in the Commons, and Theresa May was quite nearby, looking horrified the two cabinet ministers might be about, and she came in and split them up. And in uh, response to, I think, to the, to the Pike... Um, reference and Dad's Army reference, you know, Gavin Williamson has 
gone public in the last week about bills for is it jets mm. that the mm. chancellor has been mm. using, mm. saying and that not the treasury. Philip, is not Philip Hammond's had bills. to pay a six-figure bill, but not out of his. So own they're clearly pocket. not the biggest fans of one another, are they? No, I mean it's oh dear, it's all this. I don't know if you're allowed to say willy waving on TV, but that's what it is basically. Um, you know, it's just macho posturing, and um, uh, Hammond is, you know, the kind of older, you know, I mean, it's obviously horrifying for him that this 41 year old bruiser basically is um, coming in and, you know, taking over as the youngest ever or youngest for a very long time defence secretary. And Gavin Williamson clearly knows and knows how to play politics. And um, he's created all these rows and he's setting himself up to be the next leader. And who knows? It's not it's not impossible. Do you think that that is the case? Mike? You know, it's interesting. This There's a great uh, I don't know if you can get it up there. There's a very good mm -hmm. editorial by somebody in either the Express or Mail. Really ought to know the answer. To I don't that. think we can. Okay. There's an editorial, right? Whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's an editorial um, uh, in the Mail, saying that there's a connection between, or at least an analogy between Williamson and John Major. Now, John Major was promoted. Is it, is it this one? Yes. Uh, that's yeah, it. that's yes. it. See, you did it. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, uh, John Major was a bit of an outsider, state school boy, uh, wasn't considered to be anything like a leadership contender for the vast majority of his parliamentary career, was promoted very unexpectedly to become foreign secretary. Then after Nigel Lawson resigned, he became Chancellor of the Exchequer. And then he outflanked the prime leadership favourite for at least the time since Westland, which is Michael Heseltine, mm. to take the leadership. And they're saying Gavin Williams, state school boy, you know, was out of the running, um, and he might be another blonde, not Hesseltine this time, but Johnson. And he's clearly, I think, in the way that the sort of different things that he said this week to get high profile stories, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he has his eye on the leadership. Okay. That's the other thing that May is dealing with. A huge number of different egos who are looking for her job, but not sure when would be the right time to wield the knife. Yeah, Christina, I was just going to say, with all these, the cabinet meeting coming up, this rift between the defence secretary and the chancellor, Matthew's right, isn't he? Everyone's posturing for what's oh. going to happen next, whenever next is. I they, they are, they are, and uh, frankly, they all seem like a pretty unappealing prospect. Though I can't, I can't say that Theresa May is doing a very good job. She did pull something off this week, which was incredibly hard to pull off. So you know, all credit to her there. But I don't think anyone could claim that she has huge leadership qualities or vision or charisma or whatever. But you know, as we've endlessly said. Mm. You can't really have a vision at the moment because the Tory party is so completely split, as in, is the country on all of this. OK, we're going to have to take a short break, but it's a very interesting talking point next. The England cricketer who allegedly poured a pint over his teammate's head, does he really deserve to be suspended? Stay with us. Welcome back to the press preview here on Sky News. Still with me, Christina Patterson and Matthew Syed. Um, let's have a look at uh, page two of the Daily Mail, shall we? Um, this is the story. Um, Boris Johnson over in Iran at the moment, doing his best, we hear, to try and secure the release of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, who's been sentenced to five years in prison um, for trying to overthrow the regime, claim the Iranian government. Do we think we're going to get a breakthrough here? I think it's quite possible, and I really, really hope so, because um, the situation with Nazarin and Nagari, uh, Nazarin Zagari Ratcliffe has been absolutely appalling yep. and made very much worse, I'm afraid, or potentially made very much worse by what I think was probably just a mistake of Boris Johnson's a few weeks ago when he said that she was training journalists in. Iran, um, which she was never doing, and um, she was on holiday, and she took her baby to visit her, her baby's grandparents, and was arrested and imprisoned, and has suffered horrendous health problems, and had lumps in her breasts, and uh, cries on the phone to her husband all the time when they speak on the phone. So she's in a terrible situation. She's been semi-suicidal, and then to have the foreign secretary of the country of which you are a citizen saying that you were essentially spying was you know unhelpful to say the least so and i think for the f possibly for the first time boris was you know may, i don't know whether he was worried about her in particular but i'm sure he was worried about the consequences for him if her 
um, sentence was doubled, which was the threat. She was apparently going to have another trial, I think, uh, Monday this week. Mm. And it looks as though after these discussions that might not happen, but we don't know, so we'll have to see. I think, um, just to clarify, Mr Johnson did say that she was training journalists mistakenly, he said at the time, rather, yes. than, rather than spying. Just in Yes, I know, but, but for, the, for the Iranians, training they journalists is tantamount they, to they spying. They took it as that, and I think, she, I think she is due back in court. From what our diplomatic editor, Dominic Maghorn, was saying earlier tonight, he's starting to talk to the right people in Iran, but it's still the case where it's the Revolutionary Guard in that country are effectively making the decisions about what happens to her. Yeah. It's, it's very tough to know whether he's going to be able to speak to the, exactly the right people that he needs to to try and get this. I think that I, I agree with that completely. Um, and I agreed with Christina on the human aspect of this. It's an absolute tragedy for her and her family. I think her husband hasn't seen either her or their child for 19 months. Mm. Um, I think that's one of the other things that Boris Johnson is seeking to obtain is a visa for the husband to go out there. Um, I think a little unfair to Boris Johnson. I think it was a genuine mistake. Um, I, don't think I did say it was a yeah, mistake, but I, I, and I wouldn't I be at all surprised if he had been briefed, perhaps, um, in the wrong way. I don't think he'd want to blame an official, but I doubt he'd have said that unless he had received it in a briefing. He's now trying to make amends, which I think is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and as you say, I mean, he's seeing the politicians out there. And the judiciary in Iran is appointed by the supreme leader, not by a politician, by a religious uh, figure. Um, I think somebody said to one of our former foreign secretaries that negotiating with Iran is difficult enough, but negotiations within the Iran government is even more complex, mm. a very opaque system of mm. government. Um, that's why the Foreign Office, I think, is rightly trying to lower expectations, but I'm sure everybody sincerely hopes that he can get a positive But also, resolution. just to say, I mean, assuming it was a mistake, and I imagine it was a mistake, it wasn't the mistake that was the issue, it was the fact that he then refused to apologise or say it was a mistake for ages, and ultimately, there was so much pressure that ultimately, in the house he did apologize but he talked about i'm sorry if my comments were misunderstood that is not an apology and that's for me where i felt that he behaved appallingly um let's move on to the front page of the telegraph facebook and twitter uh, are going to be made safer for children how <laughs> is that going to happen tell us more matthew well i must say that i think it's in the interests of facebook twitter and these other digital giants to take far more seriously the issue of of safety the safety of children the safety of our data and also their duty to pay the relevant taxes in the various jurisdictions in which they operate because for me what seems strategically surprising is that the biggest risk to their equity value is regulation mm. they could get huge numbers of regulation coming from governments that shut down some of their profitable activities because electorates I think are genuinely getting worried and they should take this within I mean it's not just up to the state I think they should take responsibility for ensuring that they're doing the right things in all of these different areas I know as a, as a father how worried I am yeah. about my kids um, online being um, uh, contacted by a paedophile or getting access to images that they shouldn't be looking at and I'd love to see the creativity and brilliance of the people in these organizations thinking far more about that rather than just monetizing their online well, offering. New, new code of practice on its way. I do just want to squeeze in the story that we um, talked about before the break because we're running out of time very swiftly and this is over in Australia um, England's Ben Duckett has been suspended for pouring a pint over the head of his teammate Mm. in a late night drinking session. Now, Come on, Christina. <laughs> Christina, is that? You're a big well, cricket obviously, fan. Obviously, it's the world's expert on cricket and this guy I've never heard of called Ben Duckett, whose name seems strangely Dickensian to me, I must say. <laughs> but um, um, I, as far as one can tell from this little story, it's not particularly. I mean, we've all poured the odd glass over people from time to time. Really? Have you, <laughs> but, poured, a, have you poured a drink over someone? Um, I'm trying to remember. I've certainly been extremely tempted to. <laughs> but, but I think the thing is he's a, a bit of a serial convictor and has been convicted of drink driving, which is a much more serious offence in the past. So I think it's more that he's a bit of a bad boy, oh, okay. actually. Very quickly, Matthew. What do you I, I'm try I don't think I've ever tried to pour a glass. I don't think I have. Drink. I don't have think I have, any? but I have been. I don't think, I've never poured a pint over anyone's head. No, oh, I can yeah. confirm that. <laughs> but with him, you're right. You're right. With, with Ben Duckett, I think it's not... I mean, I think it's ridiculous to be suspended for one small argument with a teammate. But it's a cumulative effect 
of a series of transgressions, including being convicted of drink driving in 2015. I think the head coach is just feeling mm. fatigue at having mm. to keep justifying this kind of behaviour. Well, it's definitely splitting opinion uh, across social media and the sporting world. Uh, Matthew, Christina, thank you for now. We'll be back at half 11 to look through the papers again. Still ahead, uh, we'll get the latest on the weather warnings across the country tonight. Temperatures plummeting, snow on the way. More at 11 o'clock.